Last week we started a new series. The entire series is entitled True Freedom. And then the subtitle of this particular portion of the series is called Free at Last. And we showed a, a clip last week of Dr. Martin Luther King. And we thank God for all of our civil rights leaders. We know that they fought for social, economic, political reasons to help us advance uh, as a race and as a people. And we surely appreciate that. Let's, let's thank God for all of our civil leaders who fought for us to be where we are today. And so we thank God for that. But we also know that Jesus also came to provide an even higher level of freedom for us. And so that freedom is found through the word of God and right information. And so we started last week off in John chapter 8 because Jesus was dealing with what Paul uh, is dealing with in Galatians chapter 5. He's dealing with a group of people who are converted Jews and who had been under the tradition of the Jewish customs and they were struggling with the customs and traditions that they had believed all of their lives and now Jesus has showed up on the scene and he has a new gospel to them a, a new dispensation is being presented to them the dispensation of grace and they're struggling with that with going back to where they came from and then walking in the new uh, that God had for him. So Jesus said to him in John chapter 8, he said, if you would continue in my word, then you would be my disciples indeed. So this tells us we can get to a point in the word of God where we stop. And typically with any type of information, if you don't keep growing, you end up going back where you came from. And so that's why Jesus encouraged them to continue in my word. Then you would be my disciples because all revelation is progressive. And so we should constantly learn, constantly get new revelation. And so he told them, uh, the truth that you know has the ability to set you free. And we learned that that word know was a Greek word, gnosko, and it meant to perceive, to be resolved. Uh, you can speak clearly about, be sure of, and understand. I mean, it's not your truth until you're able to communicate it out of your mouth. Right? It's just the speaker's truth or the book writer's truth. It's not our truth until we're able to communicate that truth out of our mouths. That's when we own it and it becomes ours. And Jesus said, it's that truth right there that you know that will make you free. And so any area of your life where you may be experiencing bondage, know that that's an information. It's not an environment issue. It's not where you live. It's not your community. It's, no, it's none of that. It's information. If I can get the right information, the truth, it can take me from a bad place to a good place real fast. How many of y'all believe that this morning? And so don't think about if I could just move, if I could, don't think about a change of location, think about a change of information, okay? And so Jesus said, it's the truth that you know that will make you free. And so go to Galatians chapter 5, and Paul started Galatians chapter 5 in verse 1. I'm reading out of the New King James Version of the Bible. He says, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with a yoke of bondage. And that word stand there fast means to persevere. Free means to be liberated and to be delivered. Paul is saying we must persevere. Anytime we receive accurate new information that has freed us up from bondage, then we have to persevere in order to stay and continue to grow in the information that has brought freedom to us and not allow someone to take us back where we came from through bad information. And I don't know if you've lived a little while, that is a constant battle. That is a constant struggle because television, I mean, there are all kind of television shows that promote all kind of agendas today. And if you're not careful, it's very easy to go from right thinking to wrong thinking very fast just by being intoxicated by the television, okay? And so this is not a easy task. That's why he said, stand fast. You must persevere and be firm because there are all kind of voices out here in the earth. How many of y'all have learned that? They're television voices, music voices, friend voices, neighborhood voices, parent voices, grandparent voices. They're all kind of voices in the earth, all kind of information coming at us at all times. And so we have to, on, folk, on purpose, make sure that we're hearing the right truth so that we can persevere 
and move forward. And so last week, uh, the first point that we talked about was to stand fast against false teaching, which steals our freedom. And, and so Paul understands that really the way to put people in bondage is really through information. If, if you ever want to hold people captive, give them the wrong information. I was always told as a child, you know, people will believe anything, so watch what you tell them. And then also watch what you believe. You, you can pretty much, people will follow any, anything. If someone wouldn't start a church tomorrow, some people would join that church. Regardless of what type of church it is, because that's kind of the way people are. They don't exhaust information for themselves. They, they kind of follow. And so here we got to make sure that we stand against, firmly against any false teaching that puts us in bondage or steals our freedom. Okay, and then we talked about what happens when we put ourselves back under the law or a system of works. Letter A from last week, Christ becomes of no advantage to us. So everything he did doesn't matter because we're back under a system of works. And so it's about what we did as opposed to what he did. Letter B, we become obligated to keep the whole law, which we know we can't do. Galatians chapter, or James chapter 2 verse 10 says, if we fail to keep one thing, then we are guilty of the entire law. So if we break one part of it, we've broken in all of it so we know that's impossible letter C we learn we fall from grace we don't fall from salvation but we fall from all the benefits of salvation because God made life easy for us but when we think we have to replace what he did with what we did then we lose all the benefits that grace has provided for us by making life easy we, we again fall back under a system of works we don't lose our salvation but I know you can be saved for 50 years and not have any success. You can be saved for, I've seen people like this, you can be saved for 30 years and be broke the whole 30 years. Right, and so that's what he's referring to. When it's about you, then you lose all the benefits that grace has provided. That's how you fall from grace. Letter D, we forfeit, forfeit the victorious Christian life. We lose the hope and the spirit of hope uh, and our faith and our confident assurance because we, we base it on works. Then all our confidence is what it, it's in what we did as opposed to what he did. And that's how we go to God. We go to God, God, I tithe, I serve, I do this, I do that. How could you allow this to happen to me? How many know that's, that's hope in what you've done as opposed to hope in what he's done? We really want to go to him and say, God, you sent your son to die on my behalf. You love me. How many, we, we want to go to him and make it all about what he did and put faith in what he did, his finished works and not our finished works. And so uh, letter E, we accomplish nothing. All of our serving, all of our giving, all of that becomes in vain because our faith is in that again as opposed to what he did. Now that was all last week. Uh, letter F, we spoiled the fruit of grace which is love. The fruit of grace is love. Everything is motivated by love. And so anytime you see legalism, you're going to see condemnation. Anytime you see condemnation, you'll see negativity. Anytime you see negativity, you'll see criticism. Anytime you see criticism, you'll see judgmentalism. And I'll show you, show me, show me a church that spends all their time talking about each other and, and talking about the pastor, the leadership. I'll show you a church that's under condemnation. Show me a church that's loving on each other, come on, building each other up, helping each other out, praying for each other, and I'll show you a church that's under grace that is motivated by love. The church linked up wants to become is a church that is motivated by love and full of works of grace, and we don't talk about each other, we help each other. Amen. Can I get a better amen than that in here today, okay? So we don't want to spend our time talking about each other, tearing each other down. We want to spend our time building each other up, loving each other, and helping each other. How many know it's just but by the grace of God, you're not in the same situation of the person you're talking about? It's only by the grace of God. Whenever you see a homeless person, the thought that should come to you is not they're probably hungry because they're an alcoholic. No, the thought should, that should come to you is it's just but by the grace of God I'm not lying up underneath that bridge. Hello, somebody. And so we don't want to spend our time looking down on people. We want to spend our time reaching down 
to lend a helping hand to pick people back up. Okay? That's the church that's full of love and full of the grace of God. Number two, point number two today is we must stand firm against any teaching that steals our freedom. Now let's read Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 through 12, and then we'll go back as we'll do throughout this entire series, and we will go line upon line, precept upon precept, to learn in context what Paul is trying to teach the church at Galatia, but also us today, okay? Let's read verses 7 through 12, which serve as our uh, text for today's uh, information. This is an expository sermon, which means we won't leave the text. We're going to let the text build upon itself. Galatians chapter 5, verse 7 says, You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, then why do, you, do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the Christ cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. And we're going to talk about specifically what that statement meant. I learned Paul was a beast <laughs> when it came to truth. Paul was just raw. And you know, I was with Apostle Fred Price, who's 82 years old, grown man. And, and you know, he just really didn't care about how anyone felt about what he was sharing. <laughs> At the end of the day, he was like, either you want it or you don't. If you don't, I'm getting on an airplane and flying right out of here. I'm gone. I mean, you can appreciate grown people. He said, I'm 83 years old. I don't know how much longer I'll be around here. So take it if you want it. Praise God. If you don't, I'm out of here. That's really how Paul was. Paul, when it came to truth, he was a beast. As you're getting ready to learn today, okay? All right, so now I'm teaching today for information purposes, not as much inspiration. All right, is everybody clear? All right, and so pay attention, take notes, and follow along because it's this kind of critical information that sets you up well for the rest of your life, okay? Now let's break down what he talked about. Letter A or point number one, under point number one. All of these will be up on the screen so you can follow along so that I don't have to follow along. Letter A, they make believers stumble. Notice what he said here in Galatians chapter five, verse seven, part A of that, okay? He says here, you ran well, who hindered you? So in other words, Paul knew exactly what he taught this church. And he knew that they started off well. They were running their race well. Somewhere in there, some information got in there, and he clearly could see that this information has sidetracked them and hindered them from moving forward in the truth that he knew they had. And we know people like this all the time. How many of you know people that started off on fire for God? Right? And then somewhere along the line, they received some information that hindered them and they no longer believed the same way that they did. And we see this all the time, okay? And so I just want to take a moment to highlight some things because if we're not careful today, you'll find that the church is getting closer and closer to the world and further and further away from the, wor the word. And we have to be careful. We're, we're becoming very comfortable in our sin. At any point you become comfortable in sin, you are moving further away from God. Paul said, who hindered you? Okay, so somewhere in there, I know what I taught you, but somewhere in there, you got off and started going back. Who hindered you? Because you were running well. Well, there's so many different teachings out here now. So many different. Someone gave me a book. I have this book. And it's called, Is Church Membership 
required today. Or church membership is no longer required today. And so you've got a, a whole group of people out here that don't believe you have to be a member of a church. Now let, let's just think about that in the natural. It's amazing how only, we only think like this when it comes to church things. We only think like that. But you can't be a member of nothing without a signature. Go to American Express and give, ask them to give you a car, but you don't feel like you have to fill out an application and sign your name anywhere. You just want a car. They will look at you like you're crazy. You can't belong to anything today without your signature. Just in the natural, right? Let's also, let's talk census. How did they know how many people represented uh, the children of Israel and the Jews? How did they know there were three million people that left? How did they know? They had to take a census and record and get a record, okay? That's Old Testament, Pastor Gregory. Well, then, okay, New Testament in Acts chapter 2. How did they know 3,000 people got saved in one day? How did they know? How did they come up with the number 3,000? They took a record. How did they know two chapters later, 5,000 people? See how it's only when it, and someone will write a book, and I promise you, thousands of people will believe that. All right? First Peter chapter 2 says to submit themselves. You don't have to turn there. I'm quoting right now. Submit yourselves to them who have the rule over you and obey them, right? Hebrews says the same thing. For they watch for your souls. How can you su submit to something you don't belong to? All right? Which is why it's dangerous, folks, over time to say, I just visit churches. Well, let me tell you, churches teach a whole lot of different things. Some point in your life, you have to belong. All right, let's go a little step further. My wife and I were walk, watching the news last night. And these two couples professed to be Christian, female and female, were upset because their marriage was annulled. It was not verified and confirmed. And so uh, this is on the news. And so, and they have all this support. And so they're saying it may be annulled in the eyes of the the law or the city or whatever, the governing parties of this particular city. Uh, but we know before our God and each other, we are married. Let me tell you what I said there and thought. Which God are you talking about? Now don't get upset. I'm just preaching truth. All right? And so I don't care how you slice that. Okay? I don't care how you slice that. If that were true, neither one of them would even exist. Because they both had to have a mother and a father. All right. All right. Amen. So life would no longer exist if that were true. Now my daughter, she lost a lot of friends at school because we teach our children. We train our children and we train them the truth. So these discussions come up in school. And my, my daughter stood for what's right. And, and she lost a lot of friends over that. I said, welcome to the club. Baby. This, this is the narrow road that we walk on. Okay? And so I began to explain to her. You know, she's telling me about one of her friends. She can wear boy underwear. She can wear that three weeks out of the month. But there is one week out of every month. That should remind her. Because there's a certain kind of underwear you have to wear that week. And it should remind her I am a girl and not a boy. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good today. One week out of every month. Every month. You can't get around it. A male can have a sex change operation all he wants to. And they can give him all the pieces. But there is one piece of equipment only God can give. I don't care how hard he tries, he will never have a baby.
Now, if I was in a church that supported truth, man, let me tell you, they would be encouraging me in this church today. I don't care how you slice that. I don't care how you slice that. I care how you slice that. Okay? Somewhere in there, someone gave them wrong information. People come up to me and say, Pastor, tithing is Old Testament. We don't have to do that anymore. I mean, you know, they were running well. Somewhere they got hindered. Amen. We don't have to do that anymore, right? Now, let me help you understand. If you even study Galatians 1, 2, 3, and 4, it will tell you that the Old Testament is a schoolmaster. The Old Testament's job is to point you to the New Testament. Right? Then if we listen to the words of Jesus, Jesus said, I did not come to destroy, I came to fulfill. So we don't throw the old out with the new, we bring the old into the new. It's like until they made the $20 bill, you would have two tens. Right? And two bills looks like it's more than one bill. Two tens looks like it's more than 20. Still $20 at the end of the day. The only difference with the $20 bill, the 10 is all is in it. That's right. Amen. You all understand? That's all we're talking about here. We don't throw away the old. The old is in the new. It's just a better covenant based off of better promises. Right? And so to be accurate, yes, tithing is lower in the New Testament. It is the least you could do. All of it belongs to God in the New Testament. And so the least you could do is that. But there is teaching out there that says you don't have to do that anymore. So if we're not careful, folks, you will get into all kind of stuff. Who said we need a sheet of paper to say that we're married? I don't need no sheet of paper to say that I'm married. I don't need to go stand in front of no man, no judge to tell me I'm married. I love you. You love me. We don't cheat on each other. We're good people. We don't need a sheet of paper to tell us that... Listen to how folks, not so, so you don't need a birth certificate either then. <laughs> so you don't need a birth certificate for, for to tell us what your real name is. It doesn't make sense. It's just foolishness. And what we end up doing, folks, I want you to listen to me. I love you, but I want you to listen to me. What we end up doing is trying to bring God down to our level. And that's called humanism. Instead of us coming up to God's level. And I tell you, boy, I would be getting so much encouragement in a real word church. I'm talking about a church that loved the word of God. They would say, Pastor, that's good right there, Pastor. Oh, don't stop, Pastor. Keep preaching the truth, Pastor. A lot of places won't tell you this stuff anymore because they're scared. They're scared they will lose members and the offering will go down. Let me tell you something. If we lose members and the offering goes down, let me tell you something. My life in Christ is getting ready to go up. That's why I don't preach for attendance and offerings. I can't be bought. I just preach the truth. If you love me, praise God. If you don't, praise God. I know God loves me. I feel like I just made the devil mad. Can we just make him a little bit more upset in here? <laughs> come, come on, let's make, him, let's make him just a little bit more upset in this place today. So they make believers stumble. You were running a good race. Letter B, they distort the truth, causing people to disobey. Look at part B of that. 
Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Verse 7 there, part B. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Paul clearly understood. Someone got in there, got inside their head, hello somebody, and sent them down a path. He knew he didn't give them that information. So he's wanting to know, who did that? Who hindered you? This is why you must be careful who you're listening to. Because it is affecting the direction that you go in. Let her see. They, he says very clearly, they are not from God. Look at verse 8 here. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. So he's making it real clear, folks. And I submit to you today. Any friend, any teacher, any person who shares something with you that takes you further away from God, God did not send them into your life. Are you listening today? God did not send them into your life. If them coming into your life Put, sent you on a path that puts you further away from God and did not draw you closer to God. I don't care how fine he is. I don't care how pretty she is. God didn't send them into your life if they are causing you to live in a way that does not please him. Letter D. They infect others. Notice what he says in verse 9. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Or another way to say that, a little bit of the law, a little bit of condemnation affects the whole message of grace. Or a little bit of judgmentalism, a little bit of criticism, a little bit of negativism affects everyone. Okay? Or another way, a little bit of wrong teaching will mess up everything that you've ever learned. Isn't that good? just a little bit of it which is why you have to fight hard against it you've got to stand firm Amen. think about that I've been married to my beautiful wife for 17 it'll be 18 years this year we've been friends for 20 years it'll be 21 years this year let me tell you you see men do this all the time I hear it in the gym all the time it would be completely wrong for me now that you've helped me get somewhere and now I'm at a place where I can, I'm experiencing some success, it would be completely wrong for me to now jettison her and trade her in like we do cars for a younger model. That's completely wrong. When in reality, because she's been helping me build for almost 18 years, she should get all the benefits from wherever we've come to in life. She should be the primary, not my children, she should be the primary and number one beneficiary from where God's brought us. But you get around the wrong people and they'll start putting stuff in your head. You've been with her for how long? Man, you better trade her in. And let me tell you, that's the devil. And you've got to know that when you see it. Because guys talk like that kind of stuff all the time. There's never a time I'm in the gym and somebody's not talking stupid like that. You understand. You know what I'm talking about. There's never a time I'm in there. Somebody's not trying to locate me. You all know what I mean when I say locate me? And, and they're going to say something crazy to me. You, you married, man? But I know you, you see all these beautiful women around here, don't you, boy? Huh? I said, man, look here, man. I got one good woman at home, and seeing her is more than enough. I'm not blind. I see other people, but I'm not getting ready to go down that path. I won't dishonor or disrespect my wife or my daughter with that kind of talk. Man. You got to be real clear on this kind of stuff. One time a young lady, every time I, she always positioned herself. <laughs> every time I look up, bam, she right there. Every time. And then she going to start some small conversation with you. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? How was your weekend? 
Man, my kids keep me busy. Let's see. Friday night, me and the wife and I, we went to go grab us a bite to eat. Saturday, my son had a basketball game. My daughter had a track meet. Man, my family kept me busy all weekend long. How was your weekend? Come on, I need some real married people in here. Come on, I need some real married people in here. Once you start playing with it a little bit, that's that little leaven. You got to shut that down. Once you start playing around with it a little bit, well, well, you know what? It's innocent. Let's exchange phone numbers. It's innocent. We're just friends. Then we start texting each other. How are you? How's your day? I'm fine. How's your day? Then we go from texting each other. Let me go ahead and call her. It wasn't doing anything. Had a little time just thinking about you. How's your day going? All right. Have a good day. Click. Then we go from little phone call to where are you at right now? <laughs> you want to meet up and get a little Starbucks, a little coffee? <laughs> Sounds real innocent, doesn't it? Then we meet up, we get a little Starbucks, a little coffee, I'm looking at you, not you. I'm, where's my wife? Where's my wife? I, I, I'm looking at my, you all understand what I'm trying to say here. We're looking at each other. Now how many of y'all know, you can say a whole lot without even opening up your mouth. I'm looking at you and I'm licking my lips, you looking at you and you licking your lips. How many of y'all know we're communicating? It's called nonverbal communication. You sitting there and this button doesn't button and I'm looking. I'm, how do you know we're communicating? <laughs> the next thing you know, well, I don't have to be back to work till uh, I got a little time to kill. Well, it'd be too late if we want to go try to catch a movie. You just want to come chill out at my spot for a minute? See, that's a little leaven that started way back there. Now you got yourself in something that's hard to get out of. Because I can promise you, a trick will always be a trick. So when they don't get everything they wanted out of the deal, they're getting ready, they're getting ready to blow your situation up. They will find out where your spouse works okay. and say, is this your, that's your number? Is that the, we've been talking all this time. I know I got some real pimps in here. I know, I know the game is to be sold, not to be told. But Jesus said, freely you've been given, now freely give. I, I can't sell the truth. Do you all understand? No, how many of you know we got to get away from all that kind of stuff? This little activity like that begins to mess the whole thing up. There's no, no way I'm getting ready to trade my wife in at no point for a younger model. It makes no sense. The reality is, it's taken her, what, almost 18 years just to train me to this point. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So I'm almost a well-trained husband. I mean, you know, I ain't trying to go through all that all over again. Taking 18 years just for her to get me to this point. How many of y'all glad you came to church today? Is this ministering to anybody's heart today? That's what Paul is saying here. Don't a little bit mess up the whole thing. What letter did we leave off at? Letter D. Okay, they infect others. Letter E. They face God's judgment. Look at verse 10 here. He says here in verse 10, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. 
but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment whoever he is so Paul is being real clear here I have confidence that what I've taught you you will make it out of it but the person that put you back in this kind of bondage God will judge that situation and this is what you have to understand about God let God deal with leaders you don't have to okay Right? God has the ability. That's why you don't need to spend all your time trying to figure out if I am who I say I am. If I'm not, God will expose me. He will not allow you to be hurt over something that I'm doing wrong. Do you all understand? So don't spend all your time doing that. Spend your time growing in the things of God. Don't be in speculation about everything be a believer and let God settle the rest as long as a person is teaching you truth focus on the truth not the person that's delivering the truth because at any point if they get off God is perfectly able to judge them and deal with them and bring them down watch this without your help and if you know me I'm not the kind of person it's just not who I am if I I will sit myself down before I allow myself to be exposed. That's just where I come from. If you grow up, Detroit, Michigan, Dexter and Davidson, there is no middle of the road. You, you're either in or you're out. And so that's all I know. I was this way before I was saved. Salvation just made it more that way. So you don't have to worry about, I wonder if he really is not every man. No, not every man doesn't cheat on his wife. That's a lie from the pit of hell, man. Why do you even believe that? Every man got to have a little something. No, he doesn't, man. Where'd you get that from? Where'd you get that from? See how easily people get off? So we come in and we look at everybody sideways. You know why? Because we're sideways. So we're seeing everything through the soul of our lenses. Amen. And we're trying to put everybody in our situation. Let me tell you, everyone does not cheat on their wife. Right. 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 Everyone doesn't do that. Okay. And listen, I, I'm telling you, listen, look on my Facebook page. Go through every post on there. You won't find a female, listen to me, in the last 20 plus years of my life, that will even tell you I behaved with her inappropriately. You won't find her nowhere. You won't find her in this church. You can go to the gym that I work out at. You won't find her there. You won't find her nowhere. So much so, all the guys at the gym, a group of guys came up to me and they said, man, would you start a men's Bible study here at the gym? How many of you know men don't do that kind of stuff? They said, we're all here anyway. Why don't we just get together a little earlier and have a men's Bible study and then go do our workout? Awesome. You know where that comes from? Every time they bring some, some leaven to me, I always give them truth. Hmm? I always give them truth. Can I always say, why would I spend my time chasing a piece of tail for something that's going to last 15 minutes and destroy 20 years? What sense does that make? None at all. When in reality, when you have a Bentley at home, Cadillacs don't look as good. You know what I'm saying? Anybody here know what I'm talking about? It's kind of hard to chase Cadillacs when you drive a Bentley. Right? So listen to me, husband. Stop spending so much time looking at everybody else. Water your own garden. Make the one that you have look the way you want her to look. Dress her the way you want her to dress. Come on, work hard and get her the car you want her to drive. Come on, somebody. Stop looking at everybody else and just make the one that you have the way you want it to be.
Letter F, they persecute true teachers and believers. So if you'll see what Paul is doing here, Paul has given us a glimpse into the character of these types of leaders and what they do to people, okay? Not just leaders, but people in general. Notice what he said here, letter E, they persecute true teachers and believers. What you'll find is anytime someone looks like they might be more successful than them, anytime someone looks like they might know something that they don't know, then they'll spend all their time persecuting that church persecuting the, the the church will spend more time talking about what every other church is doing wrong and what they're doing right and all of that is a form of manipulation and control to control the minds of people that everyone else is wrong we're right so stay here and don't go anywhere else I mean no, there's no love in that there's no grace in that there's nothing in that that edifies and builds up when I've got to take an entire Sunday morning to talk about what every Every other church is doing wrong and what we are doing right. How many of y'all know you don't want to spend God's time talking about other people? This is what they do. They persecute true teachers and believers. And anytime someone is more successful than them, then they tell you, yeah, but. And then they tell you everything that, that's wrong about them. I mean, we shouldn't be that way. All right? Now, the reality is, everyone in here know about crabs in a barrel, right? The reality is, no one wants to see you get up. And so what they've got to do is pull you back down. I shared a story in the first service. I'm going to shorten it for this service. But anyone ever heard the story about the eagles and the chickens? An eagle egg fell amongst chicken eggs. And so what happened, they all hatched together. Now the eagle looked different, larger wings, everything. But when he looked around, he saw all these other chickens. And eating off the ground, guess what the eagle started doing? All right. Not realizing, he's an eagle. I'm shortening this story a whole lot. So the moral of the story is, you hang around chickens. Some of y'all, that's taking a minute to sink in a little bit. <laughs> you hang around chickens, you'll begin to act like chickens. Right? I just shortened the story because I'm pretty much getting ready to be out of time. Now, I've noticed my pastor's apostle, Fred Price. I only let two people speak into my life. And then my best friend, Bishop George Davis. I don't let anyone else speak into my life outside of those two. And I was with them Friday, all day Friday. And, you know, fellowshipping, sharing, talking. And it dawned on me, I never heard either one of them talk about anybody. Because eagles don't have time to talk about chickens. So you will very seldom ever hear someone talking about you from the top down. It's usually from the bottom up. And remember, God made you an eagle. Don't lower yourself to the level of a chicken. God called you to soar. Okay? We used to call them when I was in high school, leave those chicken heads alone. And that's all I'll say about that. Let's keep going. And then let's close right here. Uh, they are hypocrites according to what Paul is teaching here. Anytime, look at verse 12. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. And I'll explain what that means. Anytime a pastor holds you to a level of accountability that he will not hold himself to, that's hypocritical. So in other words, if I will sit 
Minister George Houston down for cheating on his spouse. If he has to be set down, if I cheat on my spouse, I need to be set down too. There cannot be a set of biblical conditions that everyone has to meet except me. Are you all listening? Right? So if I take Carla Jones, Minister Charles, let's say if I take Minister Charles Smith, and, and you know, Minister Charles Smith has a sipping problem. <laughs> so what he's telling me is I don't, I don't get drunk. I'm just an occasional casual drinker. But how many of those sipping saints are slipping saints? Right. right? And so I come to Charles and I say, Charles, <laughs> I'm going to have to sit you down, man. I understand you, you, you don't drink to get drunk, but you're drinking seven days a week. <laughs> now, I mean, it was wrong for me to sit him down, but then I drink wine myself. I mean, that's hypocritical. And so anytime you see a leader that holds everyone else to a high standard, but yet when, the, when now the spotlight is on you and you don't hold yourself to the same standard, how I many of that's hypocritical? Okay? And you should pay attention to that. Look at what Paul is saying here. Let me make sure you understand. He says here, I wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Let me explain to you what that statement means. One of the thriving mystery religions of Asia Minor was the worship of Cybele, spelled C-Y-B-E-L-E, -E, okay? Now, anyone ever heard of Cybele? Oh, this, okay, yeah, let's keep going. I forgot. This. First service, there were people in there that, that, that knew, okay? Let me tell you who that is. They believed that this was the mother of all gods, all right? And so, watch this. This is what Paul is saying here, because he knew that they were into that. So he's saying here, each year in the spring festival, the worshipers of Cybele would fast, pray, and mourn the death of Attis. Does anyone know who the Greek goddess Attis is? A-T-T-I-S. All right, let me keep going. I didn't think anybody knew. Well, they believed that was the husband of Cybele. And the divine order of the household was the woman first, and then the man. How I many you know that's already out of order? All right? So, what would they do? The priests would castrate themselves, drink their own blood, and carry an image of the young god Addis to his grave in solemn procession. Paul's point is that if you think circumcision is going to save you, then go all the way and castrate yourself and drink the blood because that would be even more powerful. See what he's saying here? So he's saying you all are being hypocritical. If you think circumcision is going to save you, then keep doing all of the stuff that you all have been doing. Isn't that good? All right. So you talk about being under teachers, leaders, Make sure that they hold themselves to the same level of accountability that they hold the people to. Okay? Now, I mean, it's wrong for me to teach tithing and I don't tithe. You'd be surprised how much of this is going on. It's good for the people, but it's not good for me. How I many know that would be wrong? All right? Now, because this is the 11 o'clock service, I want to make sure you all understand certain things. A lot of people think pastors steal from churches. The money. All right? And I have to tell you the truth. That does happen. All right? Let me tell you why it happens. Okay? I'm just educating you. Because it's all one pot. What do I mean by one pot? All the money that comes in takes care of the church and him. So he just picks and chooses. When he need a car, he go get money out of the church. Go get the car. He, he doesn't have to discipline himself and, and live on a budget like anybody else because it's all in one pot. All right? Let me help you all understand. We have what's called systems in place here. All right? I can't write a check. I can sign one, but I don't write them. 
Watch this now. There are people in here that can verify every word I'm saying. I couldn't even say it in front of them. They'd probably get up and walk out. I don't set my own salary. There is a board that determines what my salary is, and there are measurables that they use to determine that. I don't give myself raises. I don't give myself bonuses. I have to budget and make good decisions just like everyone else in this building. Amen. Where pastors get in trouble, they don't answer to anyone. There's no one that they're accountable to. So the pastor and the deacon are best friends. I'm just telling you all the truth. They are boys. And they look out for each other. Okay? Here, what's happening as we speak, okay? This church is under a review as we speak. Right? Watch this now. And these are Apostle Price. This is his accountants. So they've been doing this for over 30 years. Same company that they use. Same company that we're using. This is what they said. We will not do the church's review if we can't do the pastor's review. So, so my tax person that we've been with for 20 years, I no longer can use them anymore because this firm is saying that my taxes has to agree with the church taxes. They do. So at any point that it looks like my lifestyle is beyond what I'm compensated, they can clearly see he's doing something wrong. <laughs> Now watch this. I'm not finished. When he's done with the review, he will come and stand right up here and go over the review with the congregation. Amen. What am I telling you? When the pastor does not want to be accountable, it should be a red flag. because this is how I like to live that's why I'm so transparent I like to live my life like an open book watch this if I've done nothing wrong then what do I have to hide if I've done wrong then I need to hide everything what I'm saying is come check it all out Good lesson for you all today. Okay. A lot of people don't understand that. So they get hoodwinked and bamboozled. I personally would not be in a church where the pastor won't be accountable. I just told you a lot if you were listening. The reason they get in trouble, because it's all one pot. Watch this. And the board is all their family members. When you see the names on the board and all the last names are the same as the pastor. <laughs> then it's called nepotism. People are supposed to be hired. Now, I know God calls families, but people are supposed to be hired based off of their ability to do a job. Okay. So, yes, I have a son. But that doesn't mean I'm going to turn this church over to my son. God would have to call him. I'm not getting ready to call him. Watch this. Now, I'm educating you today because if I call him, he's going to tear the church up. Amen. Amen. That's good. He's not going to appreciate anything. He's not going to appreciate the process. Hello, somebody. Amen. That's because I called him. Amen. If God called him, then the church will continue to grow. Amen. Who knows? Maybe he wants to turn it over to George Houston. I mean, it's his church. Maybe he wants to turn it over to Vinny Thomas. It's God's church. You all understand? Everybody clear? Did you learn anything today? 
good stuff, isn't it? Huh? A lot of pastors won't educate you this way because it exposes them. Huh? So listen to what I just said. So if you don't see a man stand up here, I think he'll be finished March, somewhere in there, okay, over the next couple of months. Uh, if you don't see a man, is it March? April, April. So April, if you don't see a man come stand up here and give a review and tell you that he took my taxes and compared them to the church, he's going to go through all of this with you. I'm telling you, I wouldn't come to this church ever again because that pastor just stood up there and lied to me. If you don't see him come up here and give a public review, this will be the last time I ever came in this building. Watch this now. And at any point I stop doing this, that's when you should stop coming to this church. Anytime you stop hearing me honor my wife publicly, stop coming to this church. Because people don't talk about what they don't honor. Now, can I leave you with a little truth and let you go home today? Truth of the matter is God loves you. And there's nothing you can do to stop God from loving you. Pastor, you don't know what I did last night. I don't need to know. All I need to know is that God loves you. And he is ready to take you from wherever you were last night to wherever you want to be if you will allow him to. I don't deserve it. What do you mean you don't deserve it? The scripture says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Come on, somebody. Come on, if he freely gave his only begotten son, how shall he not with him freely give you all things? It is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. God will take you in your worst state and bless you beyond your wildest imagination just to show you how good he is. And he'll use that to lead you to repent. God loves you with an everlasting love and there's nothing you can do to stop God from loving you. Truth is, Christ became poor so that you might be rich, so that all of your needs would be met. The truth of the matter is, you might have sickness in your body, but the truth is, Christ died, and by his stripes, you are healed. I don't care what the physical symptoms say, the reality and the truth is, he paid the price for your healing, and you are healed right now. Now, I'm not telling you every person will get healed, but I am telling you that healing is available for every person, and they can tap into it by grace. Hello, somebody and walk in the freedom of their body being well, healed, and made whole. I am a firm believer that healing belongs to God, but health belongs to us. You want to get to a place where you no longer need healing, but you make decisions on a daily basis to eat fruits and vegetables and drink water more than you do anything else and exercise three to five days a week. How I many know you'll give yourselves a good chance to walk in divine health all the days of your life? You must love yourself more than you love banana pudding, chocolate chip cookies, sweet potato pies, Girl Scout cookies. Hello, somebody. You can enjoy those things, but you need to enjoy them in moderation. You can't eat them all day, every day. You can't go through a whole box of thin mint chocolate cookies. You can't do it all in one day. You've got to take two to three cookies out of there and say, this is all I'm eating today and then flush it down with a lot of water and, and go work out the next day. Come on, can I tell somebody the truth in here today? Come on, God loves you. 
Come on, stop letting people put you in a box. Stop letting people condemn you over what you did in your past. God is not condemning you. He said as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed your transgressions from you. Come on, he said I'll take your sin, I'll cast them into the sea of forgetfulness, and I'll remember them no more. Isaiah 43 said I'll blot them out and remember them no more. So if he's not remembering them, then why are you remembering them? come on stop being a prisoner of your past make today the first day of the rest of your life come on pick yourself up by your pen come on lift your chin up put your shoulders back you are somebody you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus this is the faith that this is the confidence or this is how we overcome the world even our faith this is the victory that over comes the world even our faith there's nothing that you're facing right now that you can't receive faith from the Word of God to put your feet on and stand on that God can't deliver you from it come on God can take you from broke to having more than what you need come on God can take you from homeless to putting you putting a roof over your head God can take a broken marriage a broken relationship restore it mend it put it all back together and neither one of them will ever know anything that they've ever gone through come on somebody God can take a sick body and heal it as though it's never been sick a day in its life come on God can take somebody that's racked in debt and he can cause them to be debt free where they owe no man nothing but to love them not because you're good but because God is good and he is good all the time I'm so tired of this stupid teacher that's talking about the Lord giver and the Lord taking away he needed another flower in his garden in heaven and the person is 30 years old that's a lie from the pit of hell God is the giver of life he said I came that you might have life and have life more abundantly Satan is the one that came to kill steal and destroy God is good and he is good all the time but you don't know what I'm going through pastor I lost my job all my bills are piling up God said I'll cause all things to work together for your good because you love me and you're called according to my purpose he'll take the bad bills he'll take the job and he'll put it all together and give you a better job making more money come on because you believed he was good David said it this way David said I would have fainted lest I believe that God was good while I was in the land of the living Hallelujah. 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 God is good. I don't care how you slice it. If you get the right information, if you receive the truth, God can take you from wherever you're at to where you want to be. And the vehicle that he will use to get you there will be called truth. The only real truth we can ever find is found in the Word of God. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 I'm too far gone for you to tell me any different. I'm too far gone. Come on, I can get fired on September the 6th and have it all back by December the 31st. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. All you got to do is refuse to blame God and refuse to fight with people. Just learn how to trust God. And even when people do bad things to you, if you keep your heart right, God will bring something good out of it. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 God is good. And he is good. There's not a time in your life when God is not good. And I refuse to let you ever believe and listen to another lie from anybody. God didn't put you in your situation. God is the one that will get you out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Stop saying if God is this, then why? Why don't you say the devil is the one that did it? God is the one that'll get me out of it. Switch off, switch all of that. I can tell you. So what? Sometimes rejection is God's protection. I don't know why they left me. You don't need to know why. Let them leave. Come on, let the doorknob hit them. And that's all I'll say. I won't say the rest of that. You don't need to know. Stop being depressed over what left. And start focusing on what's left. And what's coming. Now I have a word of the Lord for somebody in this room. Okay? And I'm going to speak this prophetically to you. This happened to me last night while in prayer. I usually take about two hours to pray over the service today. Because there are two services. One hour for each service. And in my time of prayer, I just heard this verse. Psalms 126 verse 5. I couldn't quote it. I didn't know what it said. I just heard Psalms 126 verse 5. I couldn't quote it, none of that. So I had to go look at it. And when I went and read it, I knew it was the word of the Lord for somebody in this building today. So I want to read it to you. It says, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Somebody in here, God has seen every tear that has fallen from your eyes. He's seen those moments when no one else around was around. And you were crying over what happened to you. He saw every tear that fell from your eyes. What God is saying to you now is that now is your season to reap in joy. So whatever made you cry, what he's getting ready to do in your life is getting ready to bring you so much joy that you're going to forget about all the tears that you cried over what you lost. Come on, if that is for someone in this room, somebody go ahead and receive it. Come on, lift your hands up. Come on, lift your hands up and receive it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm talking about when no one else was looking. No one else was looking. It was just you and God. And you were crying uncontrollable tears. The word of the Lord unto you today is that he saw every tear that came out of your eyes. He saw every one. And now you're getting ready to reap in joy. Hallelujah. 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 I certainly understand that. I hid so much from my wife and children. So much. What they didn't know, I was hurting, man. Until you've been through something like this, don't try to tell me you understand. Don't try to tell me that until you've been through something like this. Until you've lost everything that you spent 19 years working for. Don't tell me that. There are times I would have to pull over on the side of the road and just cry. Because I knew it was something healthy about just getting it out. There are times I'd be sitting on a restaurant, sitting in a restaurant, other side of town, and all I could do was put my hands down on my head and just cry. Pool, a pool would be right there on the table. Then I'd come back home and act like I'm the strongest man in the world. When in reality, the only thing that was keeping me strong was God. So when I tell you I know what it's like to sow tears, sometimes you don't have money to sow. Sometimes you don't have nothing but tears to sow. I know what that's like. Listen to what God is saying to you. He saw every tear. And now it's your time to reap for joy. If you believe that today, I want you to rejoice louder than when you were crying.
Only reason Keen and I would wipe my face and come in the house like a man of God's faith and power. The only reason I would do that was because I knew my wife needed to see that and my children needed to see that. Sometimes the reality was in here, I was crushed, man. I was hurting, man. And I want you to know God saw it. But now is your time. Hallelujah. Now is our time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I promise you, if we were in a different building, I would run so fast right now, I would just go take a lap. Problem is, in this building, once I build up speed, I gotta stop. That's why when we renovate or build this next situation, I'm putting arrows across the front. Inside of line, so you all know the track goes this way. Because we're going to be one of the most running, jumping, leapingest, shouting, celebrating churches the world has ever seen. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I'm out of time. Look up here at me for a moment. If you're in this building, everyone stand to their feet.